Ready Printer One is my largest and most ambitious 3D printing project to date. Now, for those of you who haven't seen the video on Ready Printer One, well, it's a six foot tall 3D printed arcade cabinet that used almost 1200 hours worth of printing and 25 kilograms worth of material. One of its most defining characteristics is its ability to physically rotate its screen 90 degrees. Now, you might be asking yourself, why would you want an arcade cabinet with a rotating screen? Well, there's a pretty good reason. You see, games like Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter, well, they were designed for a horizontal layout where the screen is wider than it is tall. Games like Pac-Man and Donkey Kong and Galaga, they use a vertical layout where the screen is taller than it is wide. Now, as you might guess, these screens are actually physically identical, just rotated 90 degrees. So by having an arcade cabinet with a screen that can rotate, it means you never have to pick between the two formats of games and you never end up with black borders on your screen, so you get to use it all for that sweet, sweet gameplay that you want. Now, it wasn't too long after I released the original pictures of Ready Printer One that I started getting asked, when are you gonna incorporate this rotating screen mechanism into a portable cabinet? Well, that sounds like a pretty fun project to me, and that's exactly what we're going to tackle today here on Print and Play Projects. So let's quickly jot down what this is going to look like. The design work is going to be super complicated because we already know what it's going to look like in the end. It's going to look like a miniaturized version of the already existing cabinet. So we're going to start off with an assembly, which is circular. Um, on top of that, we're going to have our marquee, which is essentially going to extend off the top and then follow relatively the same curve. Then our graphics will be in here. Inside here, we're going to have a second frame that's going to house the monitor, and it's going to ride on some bearings that'll allow it to rotate. Now, the one thing we'll have to keep in mind with the screen is that we want the actual visible part of the screen to be as centered as possible, even though the frame on that uh, particular screen is not actually centered. So we're going to have to start off by cutting the hole for the actual screen and then penciling in the size for the frame. Uh, underneath that, we're going to have to have some sort of housing. I'll probably add an extra button in here, which will be our action button. So RetroPie essentially has a button that you can hold down, and it acts as a modifier so you can get into the menus. So that'll be out of the way, and that'll be easy. Um, to save space, we're probably going to put our speakers into the sides here. So they'll either extend out slightly, or you know we'll have snap-in speaker grill, something like that. Uh, from there, we're going to need something that's going to house the main controller and probably the rest of the electronics. This is going to be pretty tight space. I want to make this sort of as thin as possible and use as little filament possible. So uh, if we're looking at sort of top down, we're going to have our joystick over here. We'll have a button over here and a button over here. So this will be start and this will be the insert coin. Um, we're going to have probably six buttons over here. We'll try and mount the Pi probably centered. Um, I'm going to try and do it so that the USB panel uh, or the USB connectors are on the back. Um, that way we can also have a cutout on the bottom here that allow us to get access to that micro SD card. So upgrades and stuff should be a snap. Um, we'll need to make sure we have a mounting spot for the USB interface for the joystick. So that'll probably be up here. Um, Beyond that, uh, since the USB hub I have is a spare, I'm probably not going to put a mounting point in it. It can be hot glued or whatever into place, but that way whatever you guys use will be fine. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, that means that we'll have probably a, some sort of cutout here where the speaker is going to be mounted to blow on the Pi and keep it cool. Um, I guess the added bonus for that is that you'll also get airflow across your hands. Uh, and then there'll be various holes uh, connecting from here to here. Uh, some sort of hole here and here to allow wires to run up to the screen as well as to run the USB power to the LED strip that's going to have to light these guys. So yeah, I think that should be it. We should be ready to jump into Fusion and try and turn this mess into something that's actually functional. Well, before we start the design work on this cabinet, it's pretty important we identify the main electronics that are going into it, if for no other reason than to make sure that we have enough space for them when the design is finished. So much like its full-size brother, we're going to be powering this cabinet with a Raspberry Pi. 
The Raspberry Pi is an all-in-one computer solution that's on a single board. What does this mean? Well, it means the only thing this needs to be a fully functional computer is a micro SD card added with an operating system. On this board, we're gonna be running RetroPie. Now, RetroPie is a piece of software that essentially brings in all the emulators for your favorite video game consoles and allows you to configure them with a single interface. It makes setting these things up super, super simple. Now the main focus on this cabinet is going to be its screen and we need to make sure that we get one that has the proper aspect ratio. This is a four by three screen. What does that mean? Well, it means that it has four pixels this way for every three pixels this way. And that also happens to be the aspect ratio that more, most classic arcade games were written for. Now this screen is eight inches diagonally and I haven't found a local source of them. I've been ordering them off AliExpress and they've become pretty popular for the projects that I'm working on. So I always keep a couple of spares around because they come in handy. So you shouldn't have any trouble tracking one down, although you may not be able to find one locally. Now to play your games, you're going to need some controls and that's what we have here. So we have a Sanwa clone joystick, or you can obviously substitute an actual Sanwa joystick, as well as some Sanwa style 30 millimeter buttons. So there'll be at least six of these on the top of it. Plus I'm going to go with two 24 millimeter buttons on the front of the cabinet to handle inserting coins and starting games. To connect all that to the Pi, well, we could just go to the GPIO, but to make the wiring a little bit simpler, we're going to use one of these zero delay USB encoders. This basically has connectors for all of your buttons, as well as for your joystick, and then it has USB out that allows you to connect it directly to the Pi with no hassle or fuss. Now, obviously, you're also going to want to be able to hear your games, and that's where these speakers are going to come in handy. So these are 40 millimeter speakers that are three watts each, and so they don't need a lot of power, and uh, they don't go super loud, but they do sound pretty good. And for the video games we're gonna be playing with the sound effects, it's gonna be fine. In order to power those, we're gonna need an amplifier. For this build, I'm gonna be using this basically super cheap five volt amplifier that uh, I think set me back about $2. Um, it does require some soldering work, so I'm including with these designs the ability to use a larger amplifier that doesn't require any soldering, um, or this guy. Uh, this one here you have to solder in headers along the bottom for your speaker output, your power input, and your line input for your audio. So it does require a little more work there. Uh, no matter what, you'll need to solder up some leads to these speakers here. These are pretty easy to solder to though, so it should be pretty good for anybody that's ever held a soldering iron. To make sure this all works really well, well, we're going to need some cooling as well. These pies can get toasty, especially when they're running some of the higher end games, so this 5 volt 40 millimeter fan should come in handy. We'll make sure we design our case so that this is mounted directly above the pie and can keep it nice and cold. Okay, so I've started the design work in Fusion 360 and uh, I basically started with the screen assembly. So this is what the screen's actually going to mount to, and uh, it's going to be the part of the mechanism that rotates. Add a little Space Invader detail here, just to give it a little bit more of a retro feel, and I've also included an indentation all the way around the screen with an access hole here. So if you want to add EL wire or electroluminescent wire, you'll be able to essentially feed it through the hole, snap it into place all the way around here, and then feed it back through there, and it'll give you a little bit of a whatever color you want glow all the way around the screen. Now, if we rotate it around and take a look at the back, there's some detailing in here. So we've got mounting points for four bearings. These are gonna be the same V-groove bearings they use on printers like the CR10. And we'll essentially create a channel around, around the outside of the uh, exterior screen body that those will ride in. I've added these little towers off the side here that will put a complementary um, locking mechanism essentially on the screen assembly so that uh, that way it can't rotate past the 90 degrees. Then I've created a piece that goes across the back of here that will essentially hold the screen in place. And it has a mounting location for the uh, screen driver, which is the board where the HDMI connects and everything and it outputs to the screen. Uh, and then I've added an additional piece here that uh, you'll able, be able to use to anchor your wires so that they don't get caught up in the rotation mechanism. So from here, we'll move on to building the screen body and uh, then things should start moving pretty quick. Now, one of the commands I use most frequently when I'm doing my design work is the offset command. The offset command allows you to essentially create an offset off an existing line so that you can essentially build like tolerances right into your design work. Uh, and it makes things a lot easier. So I want to create a body around the screen that uh, will have enough clearance that this will rotate freely. So I can tap the O for offset. Then I should be able to just highlight the line here and it'll say, how far do you want to offset? One millimeter is probably a little overkill. I'm gonna go 0.6. So that should give it enough space that it can rotate its way around and that'll be fine. 
then to create the rest of the frame I can essentially do another offset then knowing that this line is already 0.6 and if I want the entire frame to be say 5 millimeters thick, thick I can go ahead and put type in 5.6 and there we go that creates a new face and then I can essentially click on that face do a press pull and press pull allows me to essentially extrude this into the third dimension and there we go Okay, now we have the screen body done. So uh, there's some details that I've added here that are gonna be important. Um, this is essentially where it's gonna mount to the base. I've added a couple of screw holes so that we can anchor the entire thing, just in case people don't wanna glue it so it'll be easier to disassemble. Uh, there's a hole that runs through here and also goes in through the top that allow us to run wires, the HDMI cable and power for the screen, as well as the power for the marquee lights. Uh, on the side here, we've created a track that uh, the wheels will be able to roll in. And one of the things that I also added, just to make sure that this will stay locked in position, is these two notches. So essentially when it's in each position, the wheels will fall in between these here and uh, it'll give just a little extra resistance to make sure that the weight of the wires isn't enough to move it out of place. I've added an additional anchoring spot here that'll allow us to uh, secure the cables to make sure that they don't get caught up in the wheels. And then finally, we've added some posts around here that will allow us to attach it back to it. Now, it doesn't look like there's holes in them, but there are. They're just um, blocked off by about one layer of thickness of plastic. Uh, this is so that when we're printing this, we can print it on this flat surface and the support materials won't have any problems holding those, uh, those circles in place, essentially. Uh, so one layer of thickness should be super easy to break through with a screw, but should make sure that the prints that we get on these will be fantastic. Okay, jumping ahead now, we've gone ahead and created a base that the screen's gonna sit on, and it's also gonna have the control panel mount to the front. So I've tried to keep this base as generic as possible so that uh, essentially as electronics aren't available or if you have different things on hand, well, you should be able to modify some of the parts and get it to work with your stuff. So the first thing I've done is created a panel in the back. This is essentially just a giant cutout and then we can design other mounts that'll go on top of that. So this green panel here has a housing for the larger audio amplifier that doesn't require soldering, although I will be designing brackets for both. Uh, this cutout here is to allow us to feed a UX USB external mount panel in the back, which will allow us to connect like a second controller or a USB stick or, you know, other components that you might need for maintenance on the cabinet or, you know, light guns or stuff in the future if you want to get crazy with it. Uh, the hole here is to allow us to run our USB power to the inside. Ideally, I would have gone with some sort of panel mount USB connector so that none of the wires have to be permanently attached, but unfortunately I haven't found one that provides enough power to the Pi. Each one I've used gives you the lightning bolt connector, which means the Pi isn't receiving enough power to operate efficiently. Scrolling around to the sides, we've got some cutouts here. Um, these are for the speakers, but I've made them larger than the speakers themselves, so that if you can't get the exact same speakers I've got, you can design a new speaker grill that fits into this hole, and then attach your speakers to that, snap them in, and you should be, should be good to go. There's a hole here to allow us to run wires to the uh, actual control body that's going to be in the front and a 30 millimeter hole here which will give us our interface button to allow us to get into the advanced features on RetroPie. So this is coming along pretty well. I think uh, we'll move on to the control body and uh, we should be getting pretty close to completion. Well this is coming along pretty well and I gotta admit it looks a lot better than the drawing we did earlier. So the control body is just about done and uh, I just wanted to point out one of the things I always do is I try to design my cases so that they use the minimal amount of supports possible. So one thing you'll note here is that this is where the control panel is going to sit. Um, and what I've done is I've added what's called a chamfer to the bottom of that. So essentially this is a little bit greater than a 45 degree angle and it builds down to here, which means that this ledge won't need any support. It'll print nice and clean. That saves you building support material all the way up uh, on the inside here. Now inside here probably wouldn't matter that much because if you've got scarring or whatever from support material here, well, you're not going to be able to see it anyways. Uh, we've gone ahead and added some additional mounts. So uh, the Pi is going to be mounted right here. And I've created a hole in the bottom that should give us access to the micro SD card. Uh, and then the other mount was for the uh, USB interface for the controls. So that'll go here and then hopefully we'll have enough room in here to store, store all of our cables. I think without cutting the cables, it's going to be a little bit tight, but uh, there should be enough space around here that it won't be too much of a problem. All right, this is really starting to look like something. So I created the control panel by once again using the offset command. So I did an offset of 0.3 millimeters off of here and then just extruded down uh, to where it meets the border that we put to support the uh, control panel. 
From there, I just started cutting holes into it. So these are 30 millimeter buttons with a little bit of tolerance added. Um, those buttons will lock into place because they essentially have like spring loaded clips on the side. So they dig in when you push them in. So we've got our six buttons here, our joystick mount here. Uh, I created a speaker grill here and there's a bit of an inset here for the screws so that they're not rubbing up against your palms. Um, and that that's pretty much it. The border around here is for the EL wire. Again, if you want to add that type of de detail into there. Otherwise, you could go ahead and do like a filament swap and that would give you a little border around here. Uh, I'll probably provide options with these holes removed as well so that uh, if you want to do one without the EL wire, well, that is something you can do. Well, we've got a little more work left to do. We need to create a rear access panel for here, which shouldn't be a big deal. That'll just be another use of the offset command and maybe some holes in it for ventilation. Uh, and then we need to create the marquee holder and the actual marquee. So we'll go ahead and jump to one of those and uh, take a look and see how it turns out. Well, the marquee holder and the marquee are done. This is once again, a lot of use of the offset command. So I was able to essentially create an offset to create this top curve, which means that this curve here matches this one here. Uh, and then using the offset through here and then uh, adding some sort of chamfers around the edges through here, I was able to get this nice effect here. Now, the marquee isn't identical to the one used on Ready Printer 1, mostly because I wanted to make sure that the text was still legible on a smaller size marquee. So the original one had it sort of laid out here, but uh, here I've gone ahead and stacked it and we still got our little Pac-Man figures here and I think that looks pretty good. Now coming around the back, I've gone ahead and created a screen hatch off here and uh, it's got all sorts of ventilation holes and uh, it should be just fine. It almost looks like a um, manhole cover, which means that this could actually turn into a pretty nice looking Ninja Trolls cabinet, pretty simple, I would think. Well, with the work done on the cabinet, it's time to print off some of these parts and see how things fit together. Uh, and then we should be just about ready to get to the assembly of this cabinet. I'm getting pretty excited. I think it looks pretty fantastic, to be honest. While we're waiting for our parts to print, we might as well get a head start on the software. So we're going to need a couple of things to make this work. The first and probably most important is the RetroPie image. So you can head over to retropie.org.uk and from here, you're just going to click on get RetroPie. Now you're going to be prompted. Uh, you have the option to donate some money. Of course, this is a free project, but if you want to help support further development in it, and I do encourage people to do that because of how useful this software is, then you go ahead and kick in a couple bucks here. Uh, from there, you're going to go ahead and pick which Raspberry Pi you're using. Chances are you're using the two or three. They don't have an official build yet for four, but it is coming. Uh, so you'll go ahead and click the one that's relevant to you and it'll start downloading in the background. The other piece of software you're going to need is something to write this image to your micro SD card. So Win32 Disk Imager is again a free utility that allows you to read an image and write it directly to your card. So you can get that from sourceforge.net forward slash projects forward slash Win32 Disk Imager download the latest version and that'll allow us to write RetroPie right to the card. I will include links to the software down below so you don't have to worry about typing out what I just said, you'll be able to copy and paste what you need. Finally, if you don't already have 7-zip installed, which most people probably will, I'd recommend heading over to 7-zip.org forward slash download.html and picking up the latest version that suits your computer. Most people will probably want to use the 64-bit version uh, for Windows 64 because the majority of computers that have been built in the past like 5 to 10 years are 64-bit. Uh, this will handle all sorts of files and uh, that'll allow us to extract the image from the compressed file we downloaded from RetroPie and get it written to our card. Well, with our image downloaded and our software installed, which is 7-zip and the Win32 Disk Imager, it's finally time to get RetroPie written to our card. So the first step is going to be to extract the image from the actual compressed file that we just downloaded. So if you have 7-zip installed, all you have to do is right click, go to 7-zip, and you can extract it either here or to its own directory. So I prefer to go to the directory. So give it a click and it'll extract. From there, we can jump back over to Win32 Disk Imager and we'll go ahead and click the Browse button. And we can go ahead and select the image that we just extracted. So it'll either be in the directory you extracted to or in its own directory, but either way, go ahead and pick it. 
Now is the time to connect your micro SD card to your computer. So you'll need a micro SD card reader of some sort. And once it's plugged in through USB, it should pop up under the device list. So you go ahead and select. Make sure that you've got the right one here though, because whatever we do here, it's gonna wipe it. So if you've selected an external hard drive, you're gonna have a bad time. From there, click right. It will pop up and say, hey, I'm gonna erase this, are you sure? And from there you click yes. And when the card is done, you pop it out and it's ready to go. Well, we made a ton of progress today. We got our hardware nailed down, we got our design work done, and we even got our software installed, and it's just sitting over there aching to be played with. But unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this week. Now, keep an eye on this channel over the next couple of weeks, because I will be releasing part two of this video. In that video, we're going to get the parts printed and assembled, we're going to get the final configuration done, and we're finally going to get to playing some games on this new cabinet. Now, if you want to get yourself a head start, well, I've included a link down below to my website where you can actually pick up the model as well as the bill of material and get those parts ordered and build along with me. If you have questions and comments to the build or if there's something you would have done differently, let me know in the comments below. I love having discussions about these things and I love to learn better ways to do things. Also, if you have an idea for a future build, why not toss that down below and we'll see if we can't tackle it later on in a future episode. Well, that's it for this week, but thanks for sticking around to the end of another print and play project, and I'll see you in the next one.